voiceover is everywhere, and you hear it every day from radio. To TV. Watch the story, Wishbone. Snack time, Wishbone. Oh, perfect timing. To movies. Shall we play a game? To animation. See, you moronic mutants. No more turtles. Look again, Shredhead. Four, count them. Four turtles. And so much more. I don't want to grow up, because maybe if I did, I couldn't be a Toys R Us kid. Welcome to episode 32. Welcome to Who Did That Voice, the show where we take an in-depth look at the world of voiceover, including movies, TV, animation, and more. And now, here's your host, Trenton Larkin. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the show. Today's special guest is the voice of Arthur King from King Arthur and the Knights of Justice. This is one of my absolute favorite shows of all times because I'm a super huge history buff, and it mixes with cartoon and magic and mystical and something we've never seen when it comes to Arthur and his knights. Arthurian legend has always been something I've been uh, attached to since I was a boy. Uh, Excalibur, the Round Table, Merlin and his knights, the chivalry that they had, the code of conduct that they had, uh, it all meant something something super special to me. So this show took all of that and blew it out of the water. It was super amazing. I've put together some snippets for you guys to get a premise on the show, and then the interview will commence with our amazingly talented actor. Lay off him, Wally. Do you think Lug wanted this to happen? It was my fault. I made him take the shortcut. Well, some shortcut. Where are we anyway? And how do we get these clothes? You are in what you called the Middle Ages, I believe, Sir Brick. Exactly in the round table room of Castle Camelot. I hope your journey wasn't too difficult. Welcome, King Arthur. You got that backwards. It's Arthur King. For now, I am Merlin, the wizard. This is crazy. (sighs) You have to believe me, Sir Darren. I don't know why, but I know it'll sound crazy to you guys, but I believe him. You are here to take the place of the real King Arthur and his knights. To defend this world against the evil plans of Lord Viper and his warlords. With me, you will become the Knights of Justice. Evil must be stopped in my world, or there shall be no future, and you will have no world of your own to return to. Then we all go. We're a team, right? Excellent. It is as I had hoped, but the warlords are very powerful. That is why I built the round table, to help you in your battle. Hey, great! You gonna grill up some burgers on this puppy? The table will give you something much more important than food, Sir Phil. It will give you power and knowledge. Power in the armor you wear and the weapons you carry, and the knowledge of how to use them to defend Camelot. I am King Arthur. And we are the Knights of Justice! We We pledge fairness to all to to protect protect the weak and vanquish the evil! Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Who Did That Voice? Today on the show, we have Andrew Cavadas joining us today. Andrew, thank you so very much for coming on the show. That's my pleasure, Trenton. Well, today, Andrew, we're going to talk about some pretty awesome stuff that you've done in your career. Uh, But but before we dive into the things that I want to talk about and my absolute favorite thing of all that we'll get to last out of the major questions from your career, you know, the very first thing we always like to do when we have someone new on the show for the first time, Andrew, is to get to know them. And who was Andrew growing up, the young boy that became the man he is today? And how did you get into acting? And more specifically, how did you get into voice acting? Okay, wow, that's that's a, quite a trifecta. <laughs> I um, <clears throat> I grew up in uh, the middle of Canada, uh, the son of two immigrant parents. My father uh, came to the U.S. after uh, the war in which he fought in Europe, and uh, met my mom at uh, Boston University, wow. where my where my uh, oldest sister was born in in Boston. And then an opportunity brought my father. Um, north to Canada, where he finished his education in Montreal, and then uh, they eventually settled in Saskatoon, which is a place uh, slightly more frigid than Siberia, (laughs) and uh, that's where I grew up, but uh, with this sort of European background with uh, accents all over the house, and uh, 
you know, a, a sort of a, a love of the arts that wasn't particularly common um, in the Canadian persona at that time. It is now, of course. And uh, I was surrounded by a lot of uh, influences at home that were very, you know, artistically uh, inclined. Even though my father was a physicist, um, I, I was leaning uh, heavily towards the arts when I was a kid, but not really seeing it as a career. Um, uh, the, the, the imperative was that I was going to be a scientist, I think. And uh, <clears throat> I was uh, also the class clown, you see. And these, these <laughs> worlds collided uh, um, in uh, my uh, constantly doing impressions and voices and things um, that uh, led me to be sort of the center of uh, attention. And I liked that a lot, uh, and it just seemed to always kind of know what to say at the right and or wrong moment, depending on who you are. <laughs> it was always, you know, people would say, you should, you should do this, you should do that. And one of the things they suggested I should do is stand-up comedy, which uh, I have done and love doing, would love to get back to again. But the thing that really got me was um, two things. One was growing up, uh, my father wouldn't have a television set in the house. Oh, wow. So for me to get to watch my favorite shows, I really had to mean something. So when I was invited by my friend uh, uh, next door um, to watch Star Trek and other essential programming, <laughs> um, I, I clung to every word. I, I noticed every nuance. I, I, I you know, um, I really paid attention, you know, when I watched the programs that I got to watch. Yeah. Um, oh, you might hear my neighbor's construction in the background there. It's okay. No worries. Uh, progress it's good um <laughs> but um when we didn't have the television that meant i didn't get to see shows that were sort of important in my teen years like mork and mindy and things like that and uh i was at the same time uh still being the class clown and so on and people kept telling me that i reminded them of this guy on this show uh robin williams wow and uh, I didn't know what that meant. And then finally I saw the show and, and I was actually kind of mortified. <laughs> um, yeah, don't get me wrong. Brilliant, huge compliment. Uh, fantastic, yeah. genius, you know, undeniable. But I didn't realize I was that out there. <laughs> and finally it all culminated in my first audition. I was acting up so badly in an English class and uh, usually – with this teacher, you wouldn't get shut down as long as you weren't being foul and you sort of had the gist of the lesson in your quip. Um, but I fi he finally just turned to me and he pointed his finger at me and said, you, you're in a play. And bam, my universe opened up. I, I suddenly had permission to be, you know, uh, the guy I was sort of denying in, in favor of thinking I was going to be some kind of scientist. And... Uh, <laughs> Much to my father's chagrin, I ended up um, making the decision to be a, uh, a uh, an actor. And uh, that was sort of akin to Riverboat Gambler in his book, I think. And um, <laughs> he, uh, he wasn't very supportive of that choice, but he had also raised me to be my own man. And uh, that came around full circle years later when uh, he finally came to see me on stage and... Uh, was able to wear the in-house earpiece because of what he'd suffered through the war. His hearing was very poor. Yeah. And uh, it was hard for him to go to a movie or do, any, you know, appreciate any of the things I was involved in. But they had this wonderful system there where he, he didn't miss a word. And, you know, so I had the, I guess, the great honor of uh, making peace with my father and having his support, you know, it was fairly early in my career when he finally realized that you know, maybe I wouldn't starve to death or you know, end up dying on the street like a dog. Um, you know, it's it's funny. That's kind of the old world way of showing uh, you care for your kids. You know, you're trying to direct them in, into the path that you know is, is safest uh, without really communicating much to them. And, uh, you know, I think the main concern, of course, is uh, that you can just feed yourself and clothe yourself. So have I answered the trifecta at this point, Trenton? Oh, absolutely. I believe so, okay. Andrew. I mean, uh -huh. you know, and it's any parent's desire to see their children succeed. And when they know a course and a path that works for them, uh, you know, they do sometimes kind of steer us towards that because they know it works and they know it could work for us potentially. But, you know, society changes, times change. We are different as individuals. We aren't the exact duplicate copies of our parents. So, you know, there are differences and sometimes our parents just don't understand that. So I definitely understand where you're coming from in that regards. 
Well, I, I want to be clear too that my, my father was very much an advocate of doing what you loved. He just, I think, wished I loved physics more than I loved <laughs> being the class clown, you know, but, uh, he saw an opportunity for you to make a very good living probably as a scientist and then thought, you know, maybe as an actor, you'll never make any money. But like you had mentioned that before. So, but it's understandable, you know, so. Yeah. And it's not like uh, science is this huge lucrative field. Um, you know, I, I guess it's a, a stable environment to work in, but, uh, yeah. you know, I, he understood very clearly that life is short and you really need to do what you love. So in the end of the day, you know, that, that whole father son dynamic, uh, it's 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 um, it's all about love, really. You know, whether the old man seems not to approve, it's just he just thinks you're making a mistake and he doesn't know how to communicate that. So let that be advice to all of you out there. I feel like I'm running a therapy session. Where am I going with this? <laughs> No, it's good. It's good. I appreciate you diving into that, um, you know, with your past. And, and I'm so glad that he was so supportive and uh, wanted you to be your own man and choose your path. And and that's wonderful that your parents support you like that. That always helps. Well, you know, I think, I, you know, it, it took a lot of uh, me sticking to my guns and, and you know, yeah. sort of living in, in the shunned wilderness for a while. But, eh, you know, that's that's self-determination. You know, anybody has to do that to uh, really enjoy the success of their efforts, I think. Well, and, and for someone to be willing to go through the harder times to get to the better times, you know, it's something that you truly have a passion for because you're willing to fight for it. That speaks volumes. That's true. And that's, you know, often uh, younger performers will wonder how you got started or how you got into it or, you know, yeah. and, and, um, I'm getting to that now. I, <laughs> I, I stumbled uh, sort of, uh, <clears throat> ass backwards into uh, voice work, actually, particularly animation work. Uh, because of a genius um, audition that was held in Vancouver, where I uh, was living at the time. And uh, it was advertised in the local, uh, you know, every town has that sort of small paper that's more the entertainment paper, the movies, the theater times, that sort of thing, in Vancouver, the Georgia Strait. And there was an ad in there for an animation workshop. And this was a genius uh, hidden audition because they wanted just to bring out a group of people who were interested and give them some exercises to go through and record them and just see what they could find uh, in a low pressure environment without they having to reveal their project or their scripts or anything to us and, and us uh, just thinking we're going there to learn um, the basics of acting for animation, which, which we did. It was very helpful. And um, the whole thing was being run by uh a uh, fellow was an actor himself, uh, Doug Parker, put it together locally, and he ended up uh, in the cartoon. It was a hidden audition for uh, uh, Captain N, the Game Master. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, it was genius. It was the I, really a clever way to run an audition, I thought, um, because you can lose a lot of really talented people through um, them feeling like they're going to a math exam or something, you know. Yeah. Um, the pressure's on. <laughs> yeah, which, which I guess to a certain degree is important. You want to see if people can work, you know, in, under pressure. But uh, it's it's really the talented people you want and people that just sort of uh, bring the characters off the page. Of course, you know. Absolutely. So when you got the the role on Captain N that we'll mention here in just a second, was that your first voiceover gig then, or? Oh boy. Uh, I think it was, uh, yeah, actually it was because I hadn't done any voice work outside of the little bit of film and television work I'd done where they needed, uh, to uh, change a line or something. And you had to do uh, ADR in a, in a studio or replace your own dialogue. You know? Yeah. Uh, I, uh, was actually <laughs> in a session for captain N and, uh, we were on a break. Uh, we couldn't record, because it was so loud, Aerosmith was recording in the same studio. <laughs> and uh, we, so we took a break, and the uh, engineer left the room to the booth open. And I was so just enamored of goofing around on the microphone um, that I, I stayed in the room and, and with my headphones on was doing impressions into the microphone, good, good, bad, or indifferent. I was just having fun. And, and I happened to do a whole bunch of James Bond just goofing around. And the engineer, having left the door to the booth open the sound was going out into the hallway 
down the hall, there was an advertising agency doing a session, and they were looking for a Sean Connery. <laughs> That's so awesome. l- literally, the guy walked down the hall into the room, stuck his head in, and, and said, "You know, what are you doing next Wednesday?" You know, kind of thing. And, and boom, I was off doing voice work. <laughs> <laughs> that is so awesome. But I mean, it it really plays into another thing. I tell young actors is is be yourself. And yeah. and and even though, admittedly, he caught me off guard being myself. Um, I'm the goof who wanted to stay in there and play around on the microphone. Yeah, I think I would have probably done the same. <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, the three thousand dollar Neumann. I don't think I'd ever seen one. You know, I'm also a musician, and uh, you know, I I over the years have accumulated gear because I love music and sound, and and I of course uh, was geeking out of the equipment in the studio too. So. <laughs> I bet. Well, you know, the the role you got to play, I, I don't think we've mentioned it yet, but it was Simon Belmont uh, for Captain in the Game Master. And uh, you that character comes out of the Castlevania games for people who aren't familiar with the character. Um, but that show aired in 1989. And what was it like getting to work on that show, Andrew, uh, working with Matt Hill, who played Captain in and the other amazing cast members that you worked with on that show? Oh, it was, it was just so much fun. I mean, it, it, it wasn't a great amount of fun out of the f- gates. Uh, there was a lot of sweat and pressure from uh, studio executives. I believe there was five of them in the booth at one time. Good night. Five or six, you know, hanging over the shoulder of the director who I don't think quite understood the tone of how to work with performers. I'll put it that way. <laughs> And uh, I have to say, uh, Matt Hill is probably the most gracious, generous, talented, kindest, funnest guy you could ever hope to work with. And and for some reason, um, this director would really ride Matt. And um, in, it, two kind of great things happened out of that, though. He only directed the first couple of episodes before he was replaced. And Matt, you know, uh, had to work under fire. And it kind of gelled us as a cast uh, to support each other and, and, uh, you know, go for the comedy and have fun. And when the first director, who you noticed I'm avoiding his name, um, was replaced, we got this wonderful, wonderful cat named uh, Greg Morton, a stand-up comedian. I think he was out of Toronto. And he just loved it when we went off script or had a better idea or, you know, he just wanted to play the comedy because he really was very funny himself and uh, if the director's not funny the show is not going to be funny (laughs) and um we just had a ball we just had a ball we had a great cast um uh we had uh, i'm gonna forget somebody i'm searching i don't have the internet in front of me (laughs) venus terzo uh, as princess uh leah i think was her name we had uh, gary chalk uh michael donovan uh ian corlett uh, Elizabeth Barr, uh, Alessandro Giuliani. Uh, I think that's everyone. Wow. Oh, Doug, and Doug Parker, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think it was, uh, Levi Stubbs did the voice out of LA. I think I got that right. The same man who did the voice for, um, a little shop of horrors for the plant. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Fantastic voice. Uh, he did, uh, mother brain, the, the main evil, villainess at the center of the piece but it, it was just fun i mean it was uh, prior to the age of uh flogging uh, combat toys and and even though it was a video game system um we were allowed to flesh out the characters uh, uh and play with the humor which for me is always like catnip um and so for me i, mean, I just had a blast and 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 uh, made a lot of lifelong friends really wow i mean that is i mean to be able to have fun on a job makes makes it not a job. It makes it more like, uh, you know, yeah. it makes it fun. You know, I don't even know what yeah. I'm trying to say. Well, <laughs> to do what you love and you never spend a day at work. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Thank you, Andrew, for helping me yeah. with my befuddlement. <laughs> well, well, John Candy said something great about actors. I can probably hopefully getting this correct. Um, <clears throat> but he said, you don't pay actors to act. You pay them to wait to act. <laughs> And that applies much more in film, of course, where you do quite a bit of waiting between setups and so on. But it's true. You know, you get these people who would be these buffoons anyway, and you uh, harness them together and you unleash them on a set of microphones in a room together. And and (laughs) really, really fun things can happen. 
Absolutely. I love that terminology. You, you, I can't talk today. I'm so sorry. I love the terminology you, that you used with, uh, you know, these crazy people in a room and unleashing them on the microphones. <laughs> I kind of see the, uh, the horses at the gate and they like, you know, the bell goes and the gates burst open and the actors run to the mics, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it, I, it's, I used to play a lot of sports and it did you know, quite well. I went to a couple of sort of prospect camps for uh, college and the pros and Nice. And and uh, it's funny, though, because you go from being, you know, the, the kind of the one or two hot shots in your town to like there's a whole room full of hot shots now. And, yeah. and you're maybe not the fastest, you're maybe not the slowest, but you somehow all make each other, each other better. Everybody's game gets better, yeah. you know. So being able to start out of the gates with that amazing, strong cast, uh, I know it brought my game up um, several levels, you know. Well, that is fantastic to hear, Andrew. Thank you for diving into that. Uh, Captain N was always a, a show that I latched on to because Nintendo was so huge for me, um, you know, growing up in the 80s and the 90s. Um, so it, it was a huge part of my life, and I wanted to talk about it. And I'm glad it was the first real intro for you into uh, voiceover and that it even led into some other things for you. <laughs> yeah, you know, just just bumbling along, you know. Hey, whatever it takes, man. Well, you know... <laughs> I know you got to work on the Fantastic Four, uh, World's uh, Greatest Heroes. Uh, it was a series that I really enjoyed watching. I don't know how much you got to work on that show or with that cast, uh, but you did voice Bruce Banner, who is um, the alter ego of Hulk, uh, for those who aren't as familiar with the characters in the Marvel Universe. Uh, what was it like for you getting to actually voice Bruce Banner, the Doctor? Wow, well, you know, supreme nerd honor. Um <laughs> I I I, uh, I was thrilled. Um, I, I had some good friends in the room I hadn't worked with in quite a while, and uh, I I just really uh, felt um, humbled and honored to play uh, Bruce Banner. I, I had also um, years earlier been in uh, uh, one of the TV Hulk movies. <laughs> oh yeah. As uh, I think thug number one of two thugs uh, <laughs> picking nice. on uh, picking on Bruce Banner until he hulked out and uh, actually got grabbed and, and hauled off the ground by uh, Lou Ferrigno and some movie magic. Oh, that's uh, awesome. <laughs> and th thrown against the dumpster along with thug number two. <laughs> <laughs> so I, awesome. I, I Yes, yeah, so I guess I, I owed the universe some uh, Bruce Bannering to uh, make up for my uh, my sins. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, you know, I love the show because, you know, when I first started out, you know, it was always about voiceover. And then, you know, I had several voice actors say, you know, before anything else, I'm an actor first. And so, you know, there are so many things in, in an actor's life that, that played a part in their careers before a lot of times they got into voiceover. So I really appreciate you diving into that being thug number one or thug number two, because that is just, uh, you know, it's a part of your history. It's a part of your life. Um, and it's just fascinating that you got to be a part of that show. Cause I grew up watching that show too, with, uh, Lou Ferrigno and everyone. Um, and it was yeah. just so cheesy, but it was so fun, you know? So. Yeah. And you know, I, I, he was just the nicest guy, man. Lou Ferrigno. That's awesome. Yeah. He couldn't have been nicer. You know, it was freezing cold, like three o'clock in the morning. He's covered in green paint and throwing, <laughs> throwing thugs around in an alley, you know, <laughs> That's I'm sure awesome. that wasn't his dream, but you know, he hey. did a great job, you know? Absolutely. Well, I just wanted to mention a few of the other shows you've been on just to kind of highlight some of the things you've done. You've worked on Death Note. You've worked on Mobile Suit Gundam uh, Seed. You've worked on Zoids Fusers and Reboot, which are all some pretty big titles that uh, people may be more familiar with if they're into the anime side of things uh, or with the first CG series ever, which was Reboot, which was a super epic show. Um, it was just fantastic that you got to be a part of Reboot because Ian James Corlett was on the show a little while while ago and we talked about his role as glitch bob on reboot so that show always held a special place for me in my heart that was a great show uh, i think it uh didn't that break us into the uh digital animation age that it, show it was the very first cg yeah. animation show ever yeah it totally yeah. changed everything it, it's 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 funny that kind of still stands up because it was stylized digital you know yeah it was a very unique concept, a very unique look. And in fact, I, somebody told me that uh, the artistry that came for that animation was originally used in the very first music video that had some CG in it. And they were like, hey, let's make an animated show. And then that's how Reboot came about uh, with its new stylization. And, and it's 
spearheading what animation has become today, which is kind of amazing. Yeah, it's 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 really impressive. I've I've been lucky enough to do some uh, mocap um, with EA lately. Oh no way! With the full face mapping thing and all the the suit and everything, and it's just it's incredible uh, what they can do. Yeah, I, are, is there anything in particular you can talk about that you've done mocap for or? Uh, sure. Um, I did uh, FIFA 17. Uh, of course, the the cutscenes, the cinematic backstory for the single player game. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I pl- I play the father of uh, the main character. Uh, he's he's a young uh, player from the UK. Uh, he's mixed race. His mom's black, and I, of course, am a Caucasian man. And um, oh, I'm an Englishman in that one. <laughs> and and it's it's funny watching yourself animated on the uh, screen with uh, someone else's voice coming out of you. But it's it's very it's very much you. And uh, they gave me some buck teeth. Um, uh, which I guess I didn't look British enough for them. I'm thinking <laughs> that's but, funny, uh, but you can check it out. Uh, the whole backstory movie uh, for FIFA 17 is on YouTube. It's called the journey and uh, I'm not in it much, but um, it was a lot of fun doing the mocap stuff. And uh, I think I can say that I'm also in FIFA 18, but I can't say any details as the same character. He comes back. Okay. Kind of a continuation of the story then, okay. Yeah, which I, I believe they've never done uh, continue all these characters through in a through line, uh, season to season. I may be wrong, but uh, Well, it's hey, just, maybe they'll carry it through in 19. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great, yeah. But it's just it's just so much fun uh, doing that. And, and uh, I guess that's where cinema and animation meet, obviously. Um, but it is animated. You know, it's it's all rendered through the computer. That's crazy. I know it's amazing what they can do now. It's just mind blowing. (laughs) Well, you know, Andrew, I appreciate everything you've dove into with me so far, but the one thing I have been dying to talk with you about is King Arthur and the Knights of Justice, which aired back in 1992. And you played Arthur King, the leader of the football team. Tell us a little bit about that character and about that show and, and what it was like to be a part of that, that amazing cast and crew. Well, it was it was uh, it was a blast, you know, and it was uh, it was much the same gang from uh, Captain N, with some few uh, major uh, uh, inclusions, including the uh, amazing Scott McNeil, who was a, a very longtime friend of mine and just an amazingly talented cat, just brilliant. And um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I believe that was Michael Donovan's first time at the helm, uh, directing us and. Uh, um, again, you know, uh, all the network pressure out of the gates and, uh, but then we settled into a really, really fun time with that show. I can't even remember how season, how many seasons that was to, to you would probably, I think it was, two, I think it was two seasons is how it ran. It was about 46, 48 episodes, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was, it was, it was fun. And it, you know, it, interestingly for me, uh, my initials are AK, and I was the high school quarterback. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> I was I, I was very much uh, enamored of the whole uh, Arthurian uh, legend and in general uh, sort of medieval uh, <clears throat> tales of uh, of daring do uh, were my thing when I was a kid. So for me, that was it was a lot of fun to play that character. Well, absolutely. I didn't even think about that with your initials, your name, like AK. That's Super freaking cool. <laughs> you know, it's those kind of coincidental things that happen in our lives that just make some things more extra special, you know? Yeah. Well, of course, I made that connection right away because I was already in love with the story and, and uh, it was it was just a lot of fun. Well, I had Gary Chalk on the show a while back, um, but we talked about King Arthur and the Knights of Justice just a little bit. And I told him I thought it would make a super fantastic live action movie. Oh, uh, yeah, of course it would. You know, it's kind of like Power Rangers mixed with superheroes, mixed with medieval times. And it's just super epic. Like the concept was like mind blowing because I've always been a huge history buff. And King Arthur's always been an absolute favorite of mine. I actually did a history project uh, for a class in college uh, a year ago before I graduated with my psychology degree. And I used pictures and even an 
a video clip from King Arthur and the Knights of Justice when the knights first initially pledge an oath to Camelot and first transform into their armor. I used that scene and everyone in the room had said they had never seen the show and that they were going to go check it out afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, because it was just know. so epic. I mean, it's like it's something that needs to re-air and be back on the networks because, I mean, you know, and thankfully Netflix and, and Hulu and some of those are bringing back some of the retro things. But I've got to get a hold of someone at the studios and say, hey, y'all need to grab this one because it's worth rewatching. It's amazing. Well, they would probably want to update it and uh, make it more uh, contemporary. Um, you know, um, but yeah, the concept is a great is a great one. It should be revisited. Oh, absolutely. Well, and I think it was just so great that, you know, um, like I was always like Arthur King. It's so funny because as a kid, I was always like, you know, King Arthur, Arthur King, you know, haha. You know, it's like as a kid, you think about those silly little things and they kind of they amuse you and make you smile. And um, it was just so fascinating to see the the concept that they took of bringing this modern football team to the past to become the Knights to help fend off the the villains of the time uh, while King Arthur and, and Guinevere were uh, indisposed due to capture. But uh, it's always meant so much to me and having you on the show is super amazing. So I really do thank you so much for your time today, Andrew, for coming on the show. I am more than welcome. I, I do have to rectify one thing. I, I think I, I called Kathleen Barr, Catherine Barr earlier. So if I, if I did, I apologize. Um, what kind of advice would you give to somebody who grew up uh, loving the characters that you voiced and, and the impact that you had on their lives? What kind of advice would you give to somebody who's an aspiring actor or somebody who's more specifically looking at trying to branch into the voiceover world? Well, I, I'm presuming we're talking about younger people. Um, anybody. <clears throat> I have people that anybody. listen to the show of all ages. So, Well, um, they tell actors all the time, you know, be yourself. And, and a lot of times that's difficult to know who that person is, uh, especially, <laughs> especially when you're young. Yeah. So I would say, trust yourself. If you have a strong buzz on something, if you just know where that line should go and how it should go, then throw the, the character description away and, and deliver them what they have to see or hear. Um, and don't deny your own instincts. Um, and if, um, if you stay uh, in that vein, then I guess overall it's be true to yourself and, and trust yourself. It's not always easy to be yourself. I'm not quite sure what that means sometimes. Um, but if you trust yourself, uh, then you can reach higher than, uh, than you think you might be able to. Absolutely. I love that. That's a really great word. Um, wow. Thank you so very much for sharing that. So just be true to yourself is pretty much it, right? Yeah, and it's it's difficult to know what that means sometimes, but but if you just, you know, trust that that thing that you feel compelled to say is the right thing to say and the right way to deliver it, even though it might not be on the page that way, go for it. Yeah, I like that. I really do, Andrew. I mean, I think that's pretty epic. It's kind of like in the movie with, uh, I think it's Dustin Hoffman, where the taxi's like running into him and he's like, I am walking here. You know, that was not on the script. <laughs> you know, yeah, there you but go. It's, it's something that everybody says, everybody knows it. You know, a taxi cab breaks through the set, messes up the film, and he ran with it. And it's now like one of the most iconic phrases anybody in the world pretty much knows that one. So uh, stick with your gut and go with it. You've heard yeah. it here with Andrew Cavadas. So do it, guys. It's possible to uh, make an impact on the world that will last forever and leave a legacy that will uh, be never ending. <laughs> Hopefully. Absolutely. Well, Andrew, I know you said you didn't really get to watch a lot of TV, but was there a cartoon or cartoon character that you latched onto in the times that you did get to watch it that you grew up and, and felt a real uh, kindred spirit with or... Ooh, well, um, this is going to sound odd, um, but uh, I, I love Donald Duck. Oh, why is that odd? That's not odd. Uh, in the same way I love Basil Fawlty from Fawlty Towers, because <laughs> you know he's going to blow. You're just waiting for it to happen. <laughs> and uh, it's just spectacular when it does. So I guess, um, as weird as that sounds, um, Donald Duck? <laughs> I like it. I like it. Well, he's a quirky little guy, but he is super funny, even though he does kind of blow his top and get crazy angry. Well, well who hasn't you know? felt like the, the chump for whom everything is going wrong, you know? Yeah. And, and can I get a break, you know? And, and uh, it's just, you know, it's, 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 it, 
I just, I don't, even as a little kid, I kind of, I thought that's, that's insightful. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. You know, everybody latches onto something different for a specific reason. And uh, it's unique to get to hear those reasons, um, you know, from the actors that we grew up loving and knowing and, and maybe introducing you to people for the first time who might be listening to the show too. Um, but, you know, the final question that I have for you today, Andrew, um, is what is the legacy that you want to leave behind? Do you mean uh, in terms of work? In terms of your life, your work, whatever. I mean, what is the legacy you want people to say 100 years from now about Andrew Cavadas? He loved with all he had. He always gave his best. He always had time for a laugh. <laughs> I love it. Simple, but to the point and very oomph. <laughs> a lot of gum. Gumption, I guess, is the word, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not a dress rehearsal. Hey. Go for it. <laughs> Just go for it. Well, Andrew, it has been an absolute honor and pleasure having you on the show today. I cannot thank you enough for talking about all of these amazing stories, especially about Arthur King. Would you please just give us a closeout today as Arthur King from King Arthur and the Knights of Justice? And then, from the field of the future, a new king will come to save the world of the past. Okay, it's been a long time. Excalibur, be my strength! Hey everyone, and thanks so much for listening to today's episode of Who Did That Voice? If you enjoyed today's episode, please check us out online on all social media platforms at Who Did That Voice and on YouTube at Who Did That Voice 24. Also, remember to check out our website, who did that voice.org. Again, that's www.whodidthatvoice.org. Thank you to all my listeners out there. I just wanted to say, if you want to partner with Who Did That Voice, just telling your friends and family about us is the best way to share the show with others. And or leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast from. The third and final way is by joining our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Who Did That Voice. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time for more discoveries on Who Did That Voice. Who did that voice?